back, ladies and gentlemen, for the final session of the two-day international conference, Recontouring Business. This is the validatory session of the conference. And for this session, we have a very eminent personality here with us. He's Mr. Suhas Gopinath, the founder, CEO, and chairman of Global Incorporated, an IT multinational company. This is not the first time he's visiting us. He has obliged us in the past as well with his presence. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Suhas Gopinath. Now may I call upon our dean, Dr. Prabha Sampath, to please felicitate Dr. Mr. Gopinath. This is truly an honor for me to be able to introduce you all to our final speaker for the day. When 14-year-old Suhas Gopinath started Global Incorporated more than 10 years ago from a cyber cafe in Bangalore, he didn't know that he had become the youngest CEO in the world. Can we have a round of applause? You make us very proud, Suhas. Today, Global is a multi-million dollar company with offices in United States, India, Canada, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, Spain, Australia, Singapore, and the Middle East, and has 100 employees in India and 56 abroad. And I'm sure this number is rising. Among the seven honors that have been bestowed upon this young man, the most prestigious is the invitation to be a member of the board of the ICT Advisory Council of the World Bank. In 2007, the European Parliament and International Association for Human Values conferred Young Achievers Award on him. He was also invited to address the European Parliament and other business dignitaries assembled in the EU Parliament. He is also recognized as one of the Young Global Leaders for 2008 and 2009 by the prestigious World Economic Forum. Suhas is the youngest member ever in the World Economic, you know, Economic Forum's history. Most of us worry about finishing our class assignments on time or watch which movie to watch and with whom. And Suhas actually has much bigger things in mind ever since he was 14 and that's why he is where he is. You are truly an inspiration for the youth. I quote our PM Modi, he spoke recently that India has one million problems but one billion brains to solve them. I really wonder if one billion brains in India start ticking the way Suhas Gopinath's brain works. I really wonder what will happen to this country. In no time, we'll be on the world map. Uh, yes, there's a handsome young guy sitting right here in front of you. And there's a huge lady audience right across. Why would you want to see me ever? So here I hand over and run away before you throw me out. Okay, so thank you so much and uh, uh, thanks a lot ma'am for inviting and it's been second invitation and in the last year when you invited for an international conference I couldn't come. So uh, it's been fantastic to be here and uh, I think one of the most excitement for me to be here was this topic where uh, uh, it was very impactful, uh, the impactful purpose on, on how do you reinvent the business itself. So this uh, time uh, what I do is uh, so as a flow, we'll start with a small video about, uh, I do not want to repeat my own story, so we'll have a small video about that was done by the BBC, so you know the background of the company that I built and uh, yeah, it's, it's audio. When I started the company, I couldn't even spell the word entrepreneur. And I would never would have imagined that we would have a multi-million US dollar valuation. This is Suhas Gopinath. Aged just 14, he became the world's youngest CEO. He is part of a new generation of young people 
founding business empires whilst they are still at school. By 2025, India will have overtaken China with the largest population in the world. The number of millionaires in the country is set to increase by 50% over the next five years. Suhas Gopinath became the world's youngest CEO in 2000 at the age of just 14. Today, the software company he founded has made him millions of dollars. Globals, setting the global trend. But he still lives at home with his mum and dad. Suhas's empire had humble beginnings. It started with a trip to the local internet cafe. So it is where I started my company when I was 14. And I still remember my cycle being parked here. I was wearing my school uniform every day and, uh, and operating an internet shop in the afternoon. I spoke to the shop owner there and I requested him when he goes for his lunch if I could operate the shop after my school so that I could look after any of the visitors that come down to his shop. In exchange, I will use internet for free of cost. There aren't that many 14-year-olds even today who would do something as entrepreneurial as going to an internet cafe and say, can I run it from 1 to 4 to be able to access it? Very few kids would do that. They would demand that their parents get them money. Sue has decided to found his own company whilst he was still at school. I fell in love with the world of internet and I really enjoyed building websites. I could realize that I really had the passion for it because I never used to feel exhausted, I never used to feel monotonous about this. I used to sit there, so this used to be the bench. I used my old school notebook to write the business plan because I didn't have a printer, so I started to write how the company looked like after five years, who would be its team members, so uh, to fill up the positions, I started to include all my friends' names in it. At home, Suhas's traditional middle-class parents struggled to accept his career choice. I hear from a family where entrepreneurship is considered as a sin and you do anything outside uh, academics, it's, it's considered as unorthodox. Usually you are uh, reluctant, you are uh, not uh, encouraging him because you are all afraid. We are not used to this type of uh, business in our, in our family. I still remember uh, my mom walking back with me after a parent-teacher meeting where she was weeping all the way until the home. She was like, okay, I have no idea about your future, so uh, I may have to request your brother, after he's settled, to support you in your life and to look after you. Indians still continue to bring their children up to be fairly cosseted and looked after so it's really quite unique to hear about a kid who actually has the courage to tell a, you know, a South Indian family to be able to tell his parents, I'm not going to study and I will run my business. But it wasn't just his parents who disapproved. At times it was very heartbreaking when I used to call my friends on their home numbers and the mother used to pick up and say that, okay, uh, I don't want you to talk to him anymore, so I just hope you don't mind, hope you understand. We are a very middle class family and we want uh, our, our kids to focus on their studies and uh, not get involved into these internet computers. When I wanted to start a company, I was inspired by success father Bill Gates. So I, I came to know about his story and I felt that when he can start his company, why not I start my company? And uh, Suhas had established an IT business at exactly the right time. This was the start of the technology boom in India. Investment was pouring into online businesses and there were vast fortunes to be made. 2000, 
three onwards, the telecom revolution took off uh, in a way that people could connect at a really low cost. It became totally a different society. Global's Inc. expanded rapidly. Between 2010 and 2011, the company's revenue doubled. One thing special about him is he's positive always. When I feel something won't happen, he says, you don't have to worry, we will, we will do this, we will make this happen. And I don't know how, but things happen. So we will walk us through the new features of the product. In the early years, Suhas and Vinit's major challenge was being taken seriously despite their age. How to make yourself more aged than you are. So there can be a lot of strategy. Put on weight, first thing. <laughs> try to, try to uh, you know, start shaving fast so that you know, your beard start coming up. I used to leave my moustache uh, for quite some time. I used to sport a moustache because uh, I intentionally wanted to look old whenever I went to the meetings. After sharpening the pencil, the carbon which used to be there used to put as a moustache. So we tried all these permutation combinations that although we are 18 years, we make you feel that we are 25, 26 at least. As the company grew, so did Suhas's international reputation. He was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. During a trip to Davos, he had a surprising encounter. I realized that he went to the washroom and I was waiting for him to come out of the washroom immediately at the door. And I met him and I showed him that okay, I'm absolutely speechless because you've been my inspiration for actually for many years. And the statement he made was that I should be afraid of you now because you started much earlier than me. Eventually, Suhas was even able to earn the respect of his parents. When he recorded the 250th person, definitely it is a good moment for us. I am telling him, even I can't manage maid servant to cook and drive us. But you are managing all so many people. How we are managing only? <laughs> India is likely to continue to benefit from its birth boom for the next few decades. But even here, there are signs the birth rate is slowing down. It should continue. So, uh, it, it was over. It. Yeah. Now it will continue. <laughs> so, we will have to recontour ourselves and that's exactly why I'm here. And uh, individually as well, it's quite important. Uh, at one point when uh, your uh, your absence is no more felt in your own organizations that you build, uh, it's time, uh, it's a message that you, you'll have to move on and you'll have to build, you'll have to build bigger things. So. One of my mentors, uh, who is uh, was a professor at the Inside University, always used to, used to advise me that uh, after you've achieved, after you've achieved certain uh, peak, it's more important that uh, you start the adventure again and, and make sure that uh, at least your next adventure has a higher peak. And that's exactly, uh, uh, exactly why uh, I, uh, as of last October, I resigned as a CEO of my own company that I founded, uh, so that. Uh, I wouldn't like to hear my uh, my chief operating officer always making a statement that his experience is my age, <laughs> and uh, I think and he was from ICIC Bank. Uh, he was a VP there, and he moved uh, with us as CEO. So it was also very important to build a strong organization with a succession plan. So uh, so I resigned uh, to build to build a startup all of a scratch, which is more which I felt that uh, I was enjoying it, and, uh, and the fun was to build something more scratch and something that can that can actually lift up the existing industry. And uh, that's exactly what uh, the shops up uh, is a startup that we founded, and uh, uh, we've raised the first round of funding. Uh, shops up is going to lift up the e-commerce industry, so where like many of the retailers were impacted because of e-commerce. So we thought, how do we take on the e-commerce itself? And, that's exactly what shops are So I'll actually walk you through it, uh, about to what exactly is happening in the startup ecosystems. So one thing I have uh, strongly felt whenever I met my own friends within the startup ecosystem and, uh, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem in India and the Bay Area is that uh, the most of them actually realize the problem that they are solving. And, and they realize that uh, 
okay, are we really, is there a problem and would people require our solution? I think it was, uh, uh, that was a fundamental or it was a non-negotiable you know, basis for anybody to opt for uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, it was not that, okay, it was not an incremental innovation that they wanted to do it, but it was like a zero to one, that is how impactful it is. And I haven't met any founder who aspired that, okay, you know what, I would become a unicorn, I would become a billion dollar company from day one, but all they aspired was how big the problem is and are we able to build our solution that is able to, that's able to address the problem. And yeah, that's exactly uh, disruptions is about. So we all know how disruptions has, uh, has taken place when, of course, when the phone got invented, uh, we knew that we'll stick to phone. Uh, the large PSUs like ITIs and every uh, the PSUs was, was flourished in India. They started to make the telephone instruments. And when they were actually forecasting, they thought, okay, for the next 20 years, how the phone instruments look like, but all of a sudden we had a mobile phone that got invented and the entire the landline phone or the telephone industry got disrupted. There were companies like Vision Tech, which was installing those, uh, in fact, the one rupee phone coin uh, or the phone booths, that was, that was all of a sudden it was completely vanished. And the same thing, we had horse carriages. Um, there was this UK company that used to forecast, okay, uh, uh, how do they manage these horse carriages? how to build efficient roads for horse carriages, but you have one, of course, one fine day we had, so we had motor cars. And how did they get disrupted? Yes, we had, uh, we had smartphones that came, and uh, uh, there used to be this company called Nokia, and uh, which, which finally got acquired, acquired by, Microsoft, uh, by Microsoft. And the only thing when I actually look back, into these companies which are which are amazing, which are impactful, highly innovative. The problem was at one point the incremental uh, the disruption that they did went into incremental innovation. For example, if it was Nokia, they thought, okay, we will introduce uh, we'll introduce flashlight into the phones. We'll introduce uh, we'll introduce an additional SIM card SIM card port for the Indian market because they need to use two SIM cards. So it was all, uh, always the incremental innovation, and one fine day, there was uh, Steve Jobs, and you had your Android phones, uh, which started to, which started to mushroom in the market, which was very affordable. And for Nokia, where the purpose for them and the slogan that they was were always preaching is uh, the human connection, which is connecting people. So if Nokia had to reinvent themselves, they should have been the first company who could have launched. A service like Skype, WhatsApp, or Instagram, because that's exactly what they were serving. But uh, but ultimately, they thought they were in the business of manufacturing mobile phones, and uh, uh, so the feature phones uh, all of a sudden has got disrupted. Now you have got uh, the the automatic cars that's coming. Uh, in the Mountain View, we are, we always used to see them, and yeah, it's it's scary, but it's very interesting to see those driverless cars. So finally, how the world has changed. Uh, the the biggest taxi company in the world owns no taxi. The biggest hotel room owns no uh, hotel event or a, or a hotel real estate. Uh, we got we got Facebook, which is which is the biggest media company on earth, which has which which doesn't author any of the content that you see on Facebook. And and, and Alibaba is one of the biggest even uh, one of the biggest uh, e-commerce companies and and it owns no inventories at all. So, and at the same time, it also applies to software vendors. I mean, uh, in my earlier company, when we used to build software, we used to think that, okay, if we have so many IPs, we've updated so many patents, we're a product company, we're building an analytics, <coughs> and we finally, we, we realize that uh, we're not so big because you have your companies like Apple and, and, and Google Play Store, where they have a massive marketplace, or, or they're one of, one of the biggest software vendors on the earth, who, who do not author any software at all. If you visit App Store, you hardly find apps that's coming from Apple itself, but it's coming, it, it's coming from it's coming from the market to a publisher. So, uh, so it's very interesting how how the world has changed. Uh, of course, some of, of some of the areas that we've seen that uh, which can which can still be disrupted. In case if you want to innovate, if you if you if you want if you want to build a startup, the most important is. Okay, is there any is there any complex experience that we could actually solve? 
So, for example, if it's red bus, if red bus did not exist on on the bus ticketing on the go, imagine if if from Pune, if you had to visit Shirdi, or if you had to visit if you had to visit Nagpur, it was still those olden style where you had to you had to visit an agent's office, buy the bus ticket, he had to block it, he had to make calls. So you finally had this red bus, which started to solve those complex experiences. And finally, um, there was other uh, startups which were which were addressing the issue about uh, broken <coughs> trust itself. For example, Alibaba is an excellent example because uh, Alibaba is a B2B. It's a B2B marketplace. One of the very, very interesting mechanisms that they introduced was escrow payments. So if I had to buy massive furniture from uh, Hongzhou. I, I do not know, I mean, earlier days, uh, the Indian importers used to fly down to Hangzhou, or they had to fly to Hangzhou, they had to look at the furniture shops, they had to, to pre-order it, they used to have LC and all those kind of uh, complexities. Finally, you had Alibaba which told, okay, you don't have to worry about uh, who's going to sell it, I'll handle it, I'll have a verified seal on them, I'll have a escrow account, so only once a shipment is made, I'll be uh, authorizing the payments. And uh, you had the, you had this redundant uh, intermediaries. Uh, I think I think one of the off-lake innovations is by uh, is the Prime Minister Modi. Uh, for me, I was attending the startup India event, and it was absolutely amazing to see that when he when uh, he announced about this launch uh, about this app launch, where he could incorporate a startup within one day. And uh, after whenever we used to incorporate uh, our portfolio companies, we always used to wonder where do we have where do we have to fill this complex form? Where do we have to fill the six forms? And, and you find that you have a mass application form that comes via, via a mobile phone where you, you are able to instantly fill it. So, uh, so it has reduced multiple steps, it, it simplified our life. And uh, of course, you have this limited access in some of the startups which has, uh, which has started to address that, where uh, I'm not able to think of an example, but yeah, uh, on, on the limited access, I would say that it could be the startups where uh, uh, it could be. For example, uh, maybe it may not be the Uber is, uh, is the perfect example, but uh, in case if it hits my mind, I'll let you know who to, who to be the example. But Uber is also uh, an extremely interesting experience because uh, without Uber, for example, in, in Pune, if I had to do a few meetings right now, uh, the only thing my office had to do was they had to, book a, they had to book a cab for me for the whole day, even though if I had only like two meetings. Now with Uber, I'm completely independent. Uh, I, have, I have access to a massive inventory on demand and, and it has uh, definitely impacted. So what kind of disruptions do we see? One is market makers uh, who, are able to, uh, who are able to understand opportunities in new markets. Uh, you can understand the problems which are still not addressed so to the market makers so that if you find, find opportunities in those new markets that we have not heard of. So, for example, uh, historically, every company or, or, or every organization had massive amount of data and information exchange. So, uh, so before I stepped down as the CEO of my company, uh, uh, we launched a we launched a we launched a vertical that only focused on uh, on analytics on education because we realized that education institutions across the world has massive amount of, of data that is transacted. How do you how do you use this data to forecast something for for the decision makers? Within the institutions, for the management, for teachers to implement remedial programs, and uh, you also had, uh, of course, you also had product innovations that's, that's happened, which is highly impactful. So, in um, in the app that we, of course, which we built, which I'll be explaining you, it has uh, a significant part of that is is actually product side innovation or the, the technical innovation that has also disrupted. And you also have social shapers. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have companies like Selco. Uh, uh, had no access to electricity, which had no access to light. Uh, so organizations like 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 Selpa has made it uh, made it possible, which has a social impact. Disruption framework. Uh, of course, we know we know the steps. Uh, of course, the most important is uh, having the belief in the idea, having the conviction and the convention, and uh, who do you have the vision to it? And the most important is, will you be able to leap from? How do you how do you, it's not that you becoming, it's not that always every company has to end up uh, as a billion dollar company or, or it has to be in the unicorn club, but the, but the most important is are they making the impact. So for example, if, if Red Bus is, is such a wonderful example, it's not a unicorn, but the impact it's making is, I think I think they've already expanded in about, about 14 countries. An innovation that's happened from India about 
or simple kind of problem that they solved is that if you can book flight tickets on the fly, why can't we book, uh, why can't we book bus tickets on the fly? Uh, in Bangalore, we have a startup where you could, uh, so so this guy uh, who used to work with auto rickshaws felt that if I'm able to request the Uber on demand, why don't we request auto rickshaws on demand? So uh, those are the impact that we saw. So off recently, uh, uh, we were invited at the PM Modi's residence where uh, the Alibaba's founder was also there. So uh, we spoke about the impact that would happen and, and we realized that is there any way that we could partner with Alibaba to start an, an incubator or an accelerator that only focuses on, on these impactful innovations that could come from across across sectors where we could use mobile phones or we could uh, we could have startups that's actually focusing on 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 demand uh, areas. So some of the portfolio companies where I've personally invested and uh, yeah, I've uh, uh, personally invested over for the last two years. Uh, so we have the do part time, which was which was a startup by um, when when I invested, he was I think he was 20 years old. He had uh, two semesters of backlogs in his engineering, and uh, somehow we managed to convince the HR team to get recruited. He was on board um, because in our company we don't ask for mark sheets when we hire them. And uh, yeah, when he got uh, when he got hired, uh, one of the he was in uh, he was in this team where he was in a, in a team called onboarding team and. We needed we needed to do a market intelligence. We wanted a market survey to be done, and uh, I think it was uh, it was a winter season. We don't get students for internships, and the only way we thought was is there any way we can find students on a part time basis who could uh, who could who could be deployed in Bangalore streets to do you know a market survey, and uh, he came up to me. He told that you know what it's so hard to find these students because there is no website where we can hire hire part time students, so. That's exactly when uh, the same evening we started to brainstorm, and we and I was really surprised that we didn't in India we didn't have a single website that could help you to uh, hire part timers. So that's exactly when uh, 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 as a CEO something uh, since I'm since I'm resigned now I can easily tell that something which I did was very conflicting to my own role where I made my employee to resign from my own company to start a startup where I suggested that I'm going to invest in your startup and uh, yeah I invested. Uh, when I invested, uh, I took uh, approximately 25% equity in this company uh, at, uh, uh, at a valuation which I gave was about one crore valuation. And uh, at the moment, as we speak, it's valued at almost about five million US dollars. And uh, what Do Part Time is doing is they've got incubated an eBay's incubator. Uh, it's very impactful. It's like Uber kind of an app. You open the app, students, you could be working the individuals. It could be individuals who retired, could could record their video CV, add their skill sets, and they can find job opportunities around them. So, for example, if I'm uh, if I'm free from uh, Saturday 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., I could say that I'm free from Saturday 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. All these are the skills I have, and uh, and uh, and I'm looking for a job opportunity within five kilometer radius or within one kilometer radius. And I could have any of the mall or a big bazaar that could hire me to maybe stand outside and shift good flyers, or I could have a business school that could hire me to teach strategy or uh, maybe teach entrepreneurship on those four hours, or there could be there could be one of a retired banker who could be hired as an accountant for these many hours. So uh, it was very impactful where we had uh, we had housewives who started off there for these jobs. Uh, we had students who started to apply jobs, and it was very uh, uh, it was very interesting for me because we thought it would be Mac, uh, it would be McDonald's, Subways of the world, or Starbucks of the world who would start hiring these students on part-time basis, which was which was one of the categories that we thought could be could be impacted. But for my surprise, it was this real estate industry that was uh, hiring these students. Uh, they started to hire students in Bangalore from medical streams, engineering streams, management streams on Saturday and Sunday. And they used to pay them about like four thousand rupees for this weekend for the student to go and show the apartments for for the buyers. So the prospective buyers uh, uh, who wanted to see the apartments from these builders, so the builders started to hire the students, and they could, uh, pro after attending the college, they could go and they could uh, they could work for this extra extra hours, and it was highly impactful, and it was an uberification of, of the job market where it was on demand jobs around you or hyper local jobs. Off recently, we've been investing in a startup called uh, Amara Garage. Uh, 
So again, it's very, uh, it's very, very interesting. It's hardly they have four employees, uh, highly profitable. The margin that they make is all, all, almost a 50 percent. I can't disclose the revenues because they're about to, uh, uh, about to go for next round of funding. What they do is uh, they do the Uberification of breakdowns of cars. So if you're in a car, if you, if you have a breakdown of your car, flat tire, so something's not working in your car, you open the app and you request. And a mechanic who's around you could immediately pop up in front of you and would fix up your car and he will send you an estimate what needs to be done. You again approve from your app and you pay him from the app itself. So it's non-cash and you don't have to you don't have to worry that you have to go to an ATM, withdraw it, you need to pay. And again you have this rating system where the mechanic can rate you and, and you could rate the mechanic. So, so again, it's very interesting because uh, when I, I had my own car, which I, uh, uh, where the windshield was broken, I, I parked the car in my office and I was able to request a service from them who came to the parking lot, fixed it, sent me the estimate, I approved it, and the best part is I never stepped out, outside of my office at all. So, uh, and the best part is there are only four employees, so which means that it's a, it's a whole marketplace that they've built because all these smaller workshops in mechanics uh, which are um, uh, which are not from the bigger brands, uh, who are very fragmented. They thought, okay, the, the market that was already fragmented, how do we consolidate? And and they have a small center which is which is able to coordinate and onboard these workshops. So Shopsup is a startup that we did where uh, one of the problem which which I felt was uh, uh, how do you how do you discover the products around you from from local businesses? So. Uh, in fact, the Prime Minister Modi's remark was, okay, uh, so many e-commerce e -commerce companies are, are there uh, who, have, um, who have violated FDI to an extent, uh, who found the mechanism, and, it's been, and, and I personally feel that it's kind of, it was kind of an unfair competition that, that was taking place, and we've realized that how do you build a startup which can, which can so-called be the anti-e-commerce, which is like, how do you discover products around you, but the fulfillment happens in the store? And if you need products right now, uh, is, there, is there any way that I could actually research online, but you purchase off, and which we call it as a Ropa effect. So I wanted to buy a shirt, and the four times I ordered it on, on various sites, and I had to return it every time, because uh, I realized that in e-commerce, fashion is one category where we, uh, it's not what you see is what you get. So e-commerce e e-commerce works very well for Industries or, or the categories like books, electronics, which is very really standardized, nothing can go wrong. But if it's something about you, which is which is a fashion, footwear, furniture, where you need to have you need to have the touch and feel, we realize that okay, probably the e-commerce has a higher amount of return rates. So we thought, is there any way you could actually discover the product around you? But you visit to the store and you pick it up from the store, but you could actually block it from the app. And uh, so that's how we started. And uh, there was about a few weeks back where my mom, uh, she used to watch this, um, uh, the, the serials that comes on the TV, the TV soaps. So she, on a serious note, I was working on a laptop, she comes to me and she tells her, is there any way you could open up YouTube and, and, and play the same serial that was actually, was played in the evening. I told you, you already watched it. And she told her, no, I want to see it again. And, and I, again, I again actually played it. And uh, it was so interesting that I helped her because she made me pause in between, and she told, is there any way you can screenshot the screen, because I like the actress, actress Saris Pallu, and I want to show it to, and I want to show it to uh, the shops from she where she buys the silk sari. I was, at one point I was really freaking, because uh, she made me open up, open up YouTube, I thought she wanted to learn something, she wanted to do something, and she made me watch the same serial. But it was a very interesting use case where she, she saw this actress who was wearing the sari, but she she wanted to take a screenshot and she wanted to visit four or five stores to uh, with her smartphone where I actually loaded up that screenshot to show that okay I like this I like this pallu is there any way that is available? So what we did was we spoke to our engineers in house and we told her is there any way we can do snap and search? So it means that someone like my mom who sees somebody in a party and she likes their sari they likes their dress is there any way she can take a picture of their of the dress? And can it be able to discover the products around them? So uh, what we did was all the we have uh, about signed up about uh, about 500 stores right now, 
and all their inventory was uh, was already indexed by us. So we started to run this image recognition on it or pattern recognition, so that whenever you search, the accuracy was almost 95 percent in case the store had. So uh, and we started off with the Pallu recognition in the series, which was the most complex part, and uh, and we started to address it. So if I like someone's shirt, I can snap it. If you like someone's bag, you can you can snap it. In. And uh, to an approximate extent, it points out which is the shop nearest to you, which is which is selling this inventory. Our director says uh, she hopes you paid your mom royalty for that. <laughs> that was a sari I gifted her. So. Come on, that's cheap, yeah. <laughs> Go on, still sorry. And I'm a, I'm a struggling startup entrepreneur now, so. I'm a bootstrap. You're talking in terms of millions of dollars after that. Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, the millions can only happen if, if you're bootstrapped in the initial days. So, uh, of course, we will offer her some stock options uh, when, we, when we are about to launch. So uh, the other startup that we've we've launched is Perks Me, so which is which is also very interesting because we have had many organizations, including my own earlier company, where we used to we used to incentivize the employees with Sodexo coupons. So Sodexo meal coupons has been there in the industry for almost 20 years. It was these it was these meal coupons where you need to accumulate, visit a food court, and uh, if you're hosting a family for, for dinner, you need to accumulate them and you need to hand over those paper coupons. So uh, we have always thought, uh, the founders of, of Perksme, when they, when they came to me, they always uh, were asking me, okay, the Sodexo has been there for so many years, and how is that How is that? no startup wanted to replace them, right? So that's exactly where they thought that, is there any way they could launch Perksme where the employers could actually pass on the meal coupons on, a, on the digital wallet of the employee, so that the employee could use these meal coupons on a mobile format to pay in the partner restaurants of Perksme. So if you... If you were working with any of the Perksme's employer and you visit any of the restaurants, you don't have to wait for the bill. So whatever you order shows up on the app and you simply say pay, it gets paid from uh, it gets paid from your wallet. So uh, you don't have to you don't have to wait for the bill, you don't have those meal coupons, you don't have to enter your uh, you don't have to enter your card spin on the POS machine. And uh, we have another startup which is Ada Talking, which is uh, which delivers food uh, when you enter your PNR number of your train, in which train you're going, and you and you feel like you want to eat a pizza or you want to eat something from the train, you could uh, you could enter the PNR number of your train. I mean, of, of the seat in the train, and somebody uh, of their staff would would, would come and uh, deliver to your seat, which is also very impactful. So now they're again pivoting because we saw we saw a lot of food startups that were also burning a lot of cash because they were. Uh, High intense on Bangalore, so one of the one of the models that they want to experiment in Bangalore to start out with is a very similar model that's in the U.S. called Instacart, which means that uh, if I am if I am going from point A to point B, and in between, and somebody at the B is requesting for some uh, some groceries or for some food, and if I want to make some extra money, what I could do is I could uh, I could become a delivery boy. I could opt to be one, and uh, I could buy something on the way, and I could actually hand over to somebody in my in my society or in my, in my housing complex, and I get incentivized to it. So, I mean, we've got amazing, impactful startups. So, uh, out of paucity of of time and the paucity of the slides, uh, what I've shortlisted these ones, where I've also personally engaged with them uh, from their uh, from the initial days. So with Redbus, uh, Fanindra was actually building the software. Uh, if you if you know the story of, of Redbus, he had, he had missed his uh, he, uh, he, had, he couldn't find a bus ticket uh, to his native, which was uh, which, which was in Andhra, and uh, the only thing he did was that he started to he started to hop into multiple agents in Majestic, which is the bus hub in Bangalore, asking if they if. If they had any, if they had a bus ticket to Vizag or not, and most of them started to respond that no, uh, uh, you need to you need to visit the other operator because we are sold out. We are sold out. It was during the festival season, and th that's exactly where he felt that why don't why don't I have a website where similar to the flight, I'm able to aggregate all these bus operators and I'm able to show up them online, and it wasn't very easy because uh, he had to build backend software to all the bus operators, making them. To use his software so the inventory can can get exposed, and and one of the 
uh, uh, of course, one of the pitfalls that he faced while, while he was building, of course, in a country like India, was not very easy because most of the bus operators' transaction was in cash, which means that a significant amount of their of their income was unaccounted. And and if if red bus comes in picture, obviously everything is non-cash, and and how do you solve it? Because bus operators started to show their uh, resistance. So so what he started to emphasize to them was. Uh, of course, the more important aspect that he started to focus on is okay, okay, you you're saving on your tax, and this is a sale you're making across a year. But with red bus, is there any way that you could have an amplification on the sales? And in case if there is no sales or if there is no uh, delta, I'm able to bear kind of part of the cost. So it was kind of a brave move he did because he was so confident that weekdays and weekends everyone uh, would need would need buses. And, and he launched in the best market, uh, which was like like Bangalore, Pune, or, or the other kind of urban cities where it was well connected, access to internet was easy, which were IT hubs where they wanted to book at their offices and, and they didn't want like okay, uh, like at least in uh, at least in Bangalore, uh, of course most of them were from other towns and and most of them actually couldn't go to an agent in between their working hours to book a bus ticket. So after after Red Bus. They started. To, they started to promote only the IT hubs, so that he started on an experimental basis. He had. He, he was so confident that he told that he's going. He's going to offset the losses in case if they're not able to show the sales. So uh, their sales increased, and all the bus operators now started to start, started to transact uh, uh, on white, and and all their sales were accounted. We had Zoom card, uh, who was also invited to speak here at this conference. Unfortunately, he couldn't come. Uh, he is he's a very good friend, Mr. Moran, and uh, he's an American. And he came to India, and he realized that uh, the only way he could uh, he could commute in India was either by auto rickshaws or he had to hire a car for the whole day. So he realized that unlike the U.S., why don't why don't we launch something like a self-driven car in India, where I'm able to request a car, I'm able to I'm able to use this car, I'm able to self-drive the car, and I would have multiple hubs where I'm able to I'm able to drop off the car. If it was an Indian who had to build us, the first thing that we, all of us in this room would have actually thought was, okay, so what if he, he siphons out some some parts from the car, if he runs away with the car, which when he was addressing our own employees, we had few of the employees asking him the same thing, and his response was, the, the good part is I'm not an Indian and I never thought so, and uh, I never saw this, so it was a brave move that I did, that I thought I thought everything is going to, uh, everything should be fine, uh, people will be honest, and they still buffer that we will we'll have we will have 10% of instances, and and he smartly responded that's exactly why we have insurance, and one of the employee in my in my team when he was having a, having a town hall asked him okay, it's so uh, it's so uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a high asset model because you need to buy cars, and you will. You'll, you'll have to rent it out. So for you, uh, of course, your ROI is high. You'll have to raise a lot of money. So a lot of, kind of capital is, is gone in it. It's very capital intense. So his response was, it's only 20% of the financing was done by Zoom card. The balance 80% was done by SBI. So the, the most of the financing was done by banks. So it was not so capital intense. Of course, you have to pay those EMIs. But uh, it was a very efficient model for him so that he is able to uh, uh, he's able to aggressively scale. Now they have smartly pivoted again so that they can aggressively scale is that I could own a car and I could attach it to Zoom car. So whenever I need my own car on a weekend, I could ask a Zoom car to send it back to me and we would use a car. Whenever on a weekday I don't use it, I can again attach it back to Zoom car. So of course, Paytm, uh, the wallets, over 100 million wallets, uh, and it's growing. They've actually replaced cash. So uh, in in few of the cities, we are able to pay those taxi operators via Paytm. Apart from Uber, I can pay auto rickshaw guy in Paytm. In supermarkets, you could you could you could pay by the Paytm. So uh, Vijay Shekhar Sharma, the founder of Paytm, strongly believes is that you can step out of your home without your wallet, but as far as you are with your smartphone, you could still you could still manage all your purchases with Paytm. So it is one of my one of my one of my favorite statement about last more advantage. Uh, I've always I've always believed it's a statement made by one of the PayPal founders, uh, uh, Mr. Thiel. So he always believes is that it's not about in every startup you'll have competition. 
you may be the first mover advantage, but you would have somebody who is more smarter than you. So it's more, so which I tell my team and our portfolio companies is that is there any way we could be we could be we could be the last one to survive in this game. So uh, so the last mover advantage is very important. And how do you have the last mover advantage? Because to understand the failures from other startups that were in the same space as you did, understand the failures, understand the inefficiencies, understand the complexities that they had. And to address that, and at the same time, how do you, after addressing that, you need to make sure that you stay up with the competition by constantly innovating, adding more features that is impactful, and it is, and you're able to scale. So, uh, some of the best examples for the last more advantages. Uh, so, Indigo, which started as a startup, uh, where about five airlines already existed before Indigo, and now it's one of the India's highly profitable airlines. Which they started because they they did a post mortem analysis of all the of of all those competitions that were that were burning cash. So they started to plug those holes and they wanted to see as a as an Indian airline industry how do you start making profits. So we had with Google at least when I started to use internet, uh, it was the Google wasn't was in the first search engine I used. It was Alta Vista, it was Lycos. So finally we had. With Google, which completely was completely replaced, and I don't think uh, in our time we will see another search engine because they are so of course they are so ahead uh, and they are every day innovating and improving. And Facebook, whenever we say social networking site, the first thought comes to us was Facebook, but there were seven more social networking sites that could have become the Facebook of the world. It could be uh, HiFi, MySpace, Orkut, and others. But the only thing Facebook did was they were they were very much focused. Into, into social networking and that's exactly what they wanted to do it. There are many sites like MySpace that they wanted to do social networking and music. They wanted, some other site wanted to do commerce and social networking. With Facebook, they were they only wanted to focus on social networking until uh, until they achieved the scale. Okay, so if there is anything, uh, if you know, uh, do you have an interactive? Sorry. Okay. What is this kind of public interactions? Yeah. We'll just book this ticket. Yeah. Whatever it is. We'll book you on that 635. It's possible? We are just booking. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just see if the tickets are there. Yeah, if not, then. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? I'm sure they are. If not, they can leave later. Uh, actually, by popular demand, they are saying we shouldn't allow you to go. So, what should I do? <laughs> it's, so, when you are a startup, uh, when you are building a startup, you are obligated to the big boss who is the investor and he uh, <laughs> calls for the dinner. Earlier, uh, I, was on the, I was on the other side of the table where I used to harass entrepreneurs to actually to cut short the meetings and come. I used to give advices to my portfolio companies that you need to work and you don't need to network. Now uh, I'm on the other side, so yeah. But uh, we'll see if it works. I would uh, already want to upset my investor when he's called for a dinner meeting. But if, if that's not happening, I can. No, even our conference rules are we do not upset our speakers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I don't want to upset the audience, so we'll start. Uh... No, my friend has a question. Oh sure, we can she start. Says, can you switch on the lights so at least I can see the. 